Hey everyone, back for another video, and we're going to do something a little bit different this time. Don't have any parts or anything new that can really be done on the car right now, so what we are going to do oops, is go over some of the tools that I use here on a daily basis and you've seen me use in the construction of the parts for the car. So we'll go over hand tools, welding and fabrication specific tools, some PPE, things along those lines. And I'm sure that some of you have been curious as to a little bit more detailed explanation of the tools that I use here. So let's get to it and go over some of that stuff. So let's start off with my welder. It's a Miller Dynasty 350. I think it's around eight years old, somewhere in that range at this point in time. I bought it as the second TIG welder that I had. I originally had a Miller Diversion 165, so this was quite a step up from that. And in the duration of time that I've had it, it's been a wonderful machine. There's obviously a mass of options as far as TIG welders go out there, but I've had good luck with Miller stuff over the years and always wanted to stick with, uh, stick with my blue welders. So this uses a CS310 TIG torch that I typically will keep an SPW uh, flooding gas nozzle on if I'm doing reactive metal work like stainless, titanium, something along those lines. It offers a wide variety of different adjustments that you can make as you can see with the keypad on the front of it there. And you actually have the ability to change pretty much the entire dynamic of aluminum welding as you are or prior to Starting the arc, you can change the different waveforms and shapes and so on and so forth. I typically don't mess with any of that. I'm kind of caveman with my welding setup, but it's worked for me, so I've uh, just stuck with that. It also has a wireless foot pedal, which is, in my opinion, much nicer than having a wired foot pedal, as it's less clutter on the ground and less things to catch your feet on, and it makes it a little bit easier to move the machine around the shop should I need to weld on a vehicle. And even sitting at the bench here to not have that cable to kick around and get your feet tangled up in. As far as gas flow goes, I use a Harris. Yeah, it's a Harris uh, flow meter on the welder bottle. On my purge bottle, I use just a cheapy flow meter that I got from the local welding shop. I like to keep the purge and the torch, the purge and the welder bottles rather separate as running a dual flow meter, at least from my experience with this machine and my setup here, it doesn't seem to work the best to have them both the purge and the torch feeding off of the same gas bottle. And I've had issues with gas coverage in the past with that. With this separated system, it works perfectly fine, no issues. In regards to what we have on the bench here, it's more or less just an assortment of simple hand tools. And I have a big set of channel locks, a simple file, a pair of pliers that I use the pair of pliers more as a hammer than an actual set of pliers, a nice little deburring tool that the deburring tool is in my opinion a necessity as rather than sitting there with a file and trying to file the inside of a piece of tubing you can take the little knife bit in it run around a piece of tubing and it'll take all the burrs off the inside no problem much easier than using a file. Obviously have a regular hammer I have my T3, T4, T6 purge block that I designed these things years ago. Now there are a few options out on the market that uh, are readily available. I did one run of these and decided that I didn't want to pursue any more, but works nicely. You can see all the bolt patterns that are included with it. And it also will work for V-bands if you use the or if you use a corresponding nut and washer setup that will hold the V-band up against the block. Uh, beyond that, we have sets of V-blocks, which I made these when I was actually in college. Just was working on these outside corner joints, and I figured, hey, if I have two 90-degree outside corner joints, I join them together, that makes a nice little V-block that will hold the piece that you're welding in place. So beyond that, up on the top side here, I have a variety of different shaped 
pieces of steel where this started off as a big trailer hitch now I use it to uh, swedge pieces of tubing and collectors if I'm trying to make them round works well for that the other pieces are just there essentially to be weights so if I need to hold something down or I need to hold something in place that allows me to do that and to free my hands up where I can use them to actually be part of the uh, TIG welding process as opposed to using my hands as a fixture more or less. So moving on to the back corner of the bench that you guys can't see right now, I have a box that is full. I guess let me get the foil off of this. I have a box that's full of all these TIG Aesthetics back purge plugs. These work very well for both pipe and tube work. You can see it has a nice little diffuser screen. And I take one of my quick disconnect purge fittings and cram it into here. And it allows me to use the purge setup that I use for everything with these. And this makes it nice where you can see that they can be formed a little bit. So the piece that you are stuffing it into is a little bit oval or not quite round. Then you don't have any issue getting a nice seal with your purge. And I typically will run some foil around the outside of it just as a little bit of insulation and to make it a little bit easier to get them in and out and to keep some heat off of them. In addition to these TIG Aesthetics plugs, I also have these old street or strip aluminum plugs that again has a quick disconnect purge fitting on it. And I'll use these when the piece that I am welding or the actual weld seam itself has to be up much closer to the purge plug as these I believe that my buddy Brad who makes these things said that you're supposed to be I think a minimum of an inch away from the weld seam with the silicone plug otherwise you can end up melting them whereas the aluminum plug doesn't really care where it's located at so again you can see that it's wrapped in foil again to well these to make it a little bit easier to get the plug out of the piece that you are welding as you can get them stuck in a piece and then it ends up being a nightmare to remove the purge plug from the piece that you are actually welding. In my bins here I have everybody's favorite marking tool, a nice little permanent marker. And I keep a number of them around as they can dry out and if you do what I do and you try to mark pieces that are hot and end up burning the tip of it, they don't work quite as well any longer. So always pays to have a few of them. I have an assortment of different clamps that are for different wastegates and what have you. And speaking of wastegates, little wastegate heat sink purge block deal. That, that works quite well. It'll do 44, 45, and 46 millimeter flanges, both the inlet and the outlet flange. And I ended up drilling a hole through the center and threading it uh, eighth NPT. So I can again use one of my little quick disconnect purge fittings on that. I have an assortment of different bolts that I use to hold flanges to fixtures and purge blocks and what have you. O2 bongs, fixture, fi or fixture fasteners, different carbides, more fasteners, and just an assortment of different tools and bits that I use regularly here at the welding bench and it's just easy to reach up and grab them in there. I also have my two vices. This is a Harbor Freight Special that has seen much better days, but it keeps going, so I refuse to replace it, just being stubborn. It spins around on the base, obviously goes in and out, and then tips around on the axis of the center bar, I guess, if you want to call it that. Probably not the correct term, but whatever. And I also put a pair of aluminum soft jaws on it, so that way you don't have the knurled uh, contact surfaces like you would on a normal steel vise that can dig into the side of a piece of tubing or pipe or what you're working on and end up leaving an imprint of that that is a little bit unsightly. And then last but not least, going back to talking more about the purge setup, I keep always a nice roll of aluminum foil as it's the old school universal universal purge tool and as you guys see in videos oftentimes they will have used balls of foil up on the corner of the bench here and i try to use as little foil as i can i.e recycling the pieces that come out of 
one piece that I'm welding, use them on as much as I can until like this piece, they become hard and they shrink and you end up throwing them away at that point in time. But it always does pay to have some foil around as it even comes in handy for masking for painting or probably a number of other uses that you can come up with if you use your imagination. Moving on to power tools now, I have my beloved Jet Bandsaw. This thing I've had for a number of years and it's a little beat up looking on the outside, but it continues to cut and not cause me any issues. I mean, aside from swapping bandsaw blades as they wear out, or I guess in the case of how I use them when they finally snap, it has been a trooper and it just keeps going and going. So. It's a seven inch, I guess seven inch by 12 inch is what the, oh, or what the size of material that you can cut with it is. And it's cut all different materials, titanium, stainless, aluminum. I've tried cutting it, ink and L with it before. Again, not having much luck with that as Inko is so hard, you can't easily do it with a bandsaw, uh, mild steel, and the list goes on. So it's been very good to me and it has a nice hydraulic speed control on it so you can make it drop as quickly or as slowly as you would like. It has a stopper for the piece that you are feeding in to be cut. It has adjustable guides on it and obviously the vise in the bed itself can be adjusted for different sizes of materials that you are cutting. So, highly recommend these jet saws. I can't remember the model number offhand if I can look it up, or if I can remember what it is, I'll list it down in the description. But it's been a great saw, and I don't really have any need for another one with how great this thing's been. Next up, we have my belt sanders. We have a Harbor Freight Special 6x48 on this side that it is, or I've used this belt sander for as long as I've been building exhaust manifolds, and it has not let me down surprisingly you don't typically think of harbor freight as being an investment that will last for the long term but this thing has been great and i can't say enough good things about it it is modified a little bit as opposed to how you would receive it from the harbor freight store or if you order it online modifications are an upgraded motor and the old factory motor was not bad the motor still worked. The issue was the pulley somehow came loose and the keyway ended up making its own bore around the inside of that pulley and badly enough where I couldn't get the pulley off of it easily. So I took that as an opportunity to put a larger, more powerful motor on it. Otherwise, I would have just left it alone and everything would have been fine. The other thing that I did is I installed a small little it's just essentially a light switch or a power switch that you'd see in a house or a shop or normal construction work. Not any special switch is what I'm getting at. And I did that as the factory switch ended up dying on it. And this was the quickest, cheapest, and easiest alternative. On this side over here, we have the Big Daddy Grizzly 6x80 belt sander. That this is actually a 220 volt belt sander that I use to sand head flanges or do any significant metal shaping where I really have to lay into the piece that I am sanding. And on both of these sanders, I use 36 grit abrasive as that is enough to pretty quickly take material off of a piece or be able to shape it without getting down to like your 24 grit or a very, very coarse grit that just seems a bit too aggressive in my opinion. So both of these sanders, I don't really have any bad things to say about them. They've been great and continue to be great. So until I have a massive issue with one of them or they just all, they just flat out break, these are what I will continue to use. Now we have one of my all time favorite tools, which is my DeWalt angle grinder. 
Now I've used a few different angle grinders over the years. I originally had a Harbor Freight one, switched from that to a Hitachi, and ended up getting this DeWalt one as the third angle grinder that I've had, and this is the one that I have been truly the most happy with. And this one is a little bit special, I guess you could call it, as when I was researching buying a new angle grinder after the Hitachi one died, this offered a low enough uh, rotational speed where it did not exceed the threshold of a six inch disc as I used to use six inch uh, cutting discs very or pretty much primarily on the previous angle grinders. And the issue that you can run into is if the grinder rotates at a speed that exceeds that of the cutting disc that you were using then you can have the wheel pop on you and that is a bad day. So this grinder keeps the RPM within the threshold of being able to use one of those six inch discs and it actually applies more amperage to the uh, or the motor applies more amperage rather so you can really lay into what you're cutting with this thing and it doesn't skip the beat so I'll use Diablo tools abrasives and I really like their cutoff wheels they're a little bit thinner and allow you to cut more quickly through the material that you are cutting and don't do what I do and remove the guard from it it is not the best idea, but it's just what I do. So kind of do as I say, not as I do in this instance. So these things are kind of a universal cutting tool, which is kind of neat if you know how to use them properly. You can cut things that are big, small, thick, thin. You can use them to make radius cuts if you know how to tip the grinder correctly. And if you know how to mark and draft things properly and are steady enough with how you are manipulating the tool and you can make very straight cuts that don't really need much cleanup afterwards so i even recommend these for people that are starting out more than a uh, bandsaw even as you can do so much with these with just a little bit of patience and a little bit of focus and save yourself a bunch of money when you're first starting out because not everybody has the money to buy a thousand plus dollar bandsaw as opposed to a couple hundred dollar angle grinder. Moving over to the drill press. This is a 20 inch drill press again from Harbor Freight and I had a smaller Craftsman one before this that did okay. It did what I needed it to do but when it came time to upgrade I wanted something a little bit larger and this fit the fit all of the criteria that I was looking for in a drill press and was cost effective enough that it uh, was what I decided to go with. So it's a big girl as you can see. Uh, the chuck will take pretty much any size drill bit that I would normally use here because I typically don't go much above a half inch drill bit for most of the things that I'm doing. It has a depth stop to it, so thread that back in. So depending on the depth that you want to drill to, you can set it to stop at that given point to make repeatable chamfers or if you're drilling blind holes, what have you. It also has the ability to put coolant onto the bit or cutting fluid. In this case, I use WD-40. It has a nice little light on it to be able to see what you're doing and up top it has a multitude of speed adjustments there are oh, 12 listed there and it's a three pulley system so you can get it to run pretty much as quickly or as slowly as you would like so I believe the bed will tilt as well and there's a rack and pinion on the vertical shaft here that will allow you to raise and lower the bed of the saw as you see necessary or as is necessary for what you're working on. I keep this little uh, drill press vise in here that just helps me to hold the piece that I'm working on. And other than that, that's pretty much the drill press. And it's short, simple, to the point, and it works well. So I've been pretty happy with it so far.
And last but not least, in the realm of power tools are the two lifts that I have in here. I can't remember where I ordered these from. They're just simple, basic lifts that are from pretty much name your automotive uh, shop supply warehouse. They have upgraded uh, motors and pumps on them to make them a little more durable, a little bit more reliable. And they are a very simple uh, individual lock mechanism. So there's no central lock that you pull on the post where you have the motor like you've seen on some of the lifts, or that you see on some lifts rather. There's actually little individual pull tabs you have to hit on the bottom of each of the arm mounts there. So a little bit of a pain that way, but not the end of the world. Um, they've been great, or they've been all right, I should say. As far as lifting the car up and down, they do well for that, but I believe I've had to replace two piston seals on them. And the way that the actual hydraulic ram is designed, you can tell that when somebody had assembled it, that they nicked the seal or something like that along the threads where you get to the innards of the hydraulic ram on one of the caps. And if you nick the seal, it's only a matter of time until the force of that hydraulic fluid will find the path of least resistance or make one if there's a damaged seal. And they end up blowing fluid out of the vent holes on the hydraulic rams. And I've had, I believe it was the Supra get stuck at the max position on the lift until the ram was able to be removed and the seal replaced. So a little bit of a pain that way, but once you get the seals put in and you are obviously going to take better care, or I would hope that you would take better care of your tools than the person initially assembling them in a factory, you get those seals replaced and everything is good to go from there. So more than that, there really isn't too much. It's a simple two post lift, not too exciting, not too much to say about it. Car goes up and down, can work on it much more easily than doing it on your back on the ground. So that's uh, why I have one. As far as air tools go, I have four that I use primarily that are sitting on the tray of this stool here. So first one being the DA, I'll use this to put the surface finish that I'm looking for on the visible sides of flanges, head flanges, turbine flanges, what have you. It allows you to put a nice uniform surface finish on the piece of metal that you're working with. and rather than sitting there and scrubbing a piece of scotch bright to death on the piece of metal. This is a nice powered way to do it that you cut down on the amount of time that is spent prepping that piece and it makes it much easier that way. So simple piece, have a soft pad as well that on the Velcro side, it's just a pad that goes onto the hook side of a Velcro piece here that puts a little bit of cushion or provides a little bit of cushion so you can work on a piece of tubing more easily. I have two 90 degree die grinders here. This one I use for typically doing uh, or altering the surface finish on the logo tabs that I put on the manifolds and any other little grinding from there. So it's set up to run, what are these? Like a little two inch disc or something along those lines, whatever the small roll lock discs are. And I use a, diff a variety of different abrasives on it, just depending on what the job at hand is. This one is a little bit larger one. So the pad has a larger footprint, I should say. And this I run pretty much solely these large red scotch bright discs on. So for medium surface prep or blending and things along those lines, works well for that. And last but not least, we have the extended uh, straight die grinder here that this one houses a carbide burr on it pretty much at all times. And it also has adjustable speed via this red collar on the back side here. So as you are applying the air pressure to it, you can sit here and actually adjust how fast 
it is rotating rather than having to throttle it with the actual trigger on it. it makes it a little bit easier that way. So I like using this extended one as it is very, very smooth to use. You keep your hands away from the piece that you're working on and with it being an extended neck like this, if you're porting a cylinder head or porting a merge collector, something you have to really get deep down in there with your grinding tool, this allows you to do that without contacting the actual body of the grinder and it makes it much nicer and less cumbersome that way. Tucked away in this rack is my actual air compressor. It's an Ingersoll Rand 80 gallon air compressor, just a normal uh, normal one that you would find. I think I got this one from Tractor Supply Co. actually. And not anything fancy or anything special. Just simple 220 volt compressor. It provides air to everything that uses air in the shop. I had a small Craftsman wheeled portable one before that worked fine but was extremely loud and didn't have, I guess what you could call the duty cycle of air that you would get with something like this. This, you have such a large volume of air that as you're using a tool, it's the system's already replenishing and you don't have to worry about running out of air unless you just vented the entire contents of the compressor out. So I've been happy with it. It just sits here, no drama, and does its thing, provides air pressure, and can't really ask for much more than that out of an air compressor. Back over at the bench here, and we'll go over measuring tools now. So, <clears throat> I use a fairly small number of measuring tools, at least on a daily basis. Obviously, I have more tools than what are pictured here, but these are the basics of what I use. So, you see me use a lot in drafting work these squares. I love using these things makes for nice, easy to trace out straight lines, provided that you have a straight edge to work off of. It has a level in it, and these also, even though I don't use them, they have little scribes in here. So say you get your piece where you want it, you can take this, drag it along the surface of the metal that you're working on, or the material rather, because you can use them on more than just metal, obviously, and you have your line put on there. So love using these things. I have two pictured here. I have a third longer one that I will use for making brackets and drafting and doing all kinds of things like that. Tape measure wise, I use this simple, cheap little Stanley one that I believe I got from Home Depot. And the one thing I tried to do is to use the same tape measure for everything. So if there's any little inconsistencies with how it is manufactured, it is not a big deal provided that you are using the same tape for everything that you are doing. Beyond that, we have a digital caliper, which I'll use this to plot out different points for holes, obviously to measure diameters, to measure thicknesses, all the things you'd normally use them for. It's very handy if I am specking bolts out, like replacing normal factory fasteners with titanium or so on and so forth, using the uh, depth gauge on it to determine the depth of blind holes or to figure out the shank length and thread length of fasteners it makes it very very easy for that and the last one that I will go over here that I use all the time and you guys have seen in videos when I make manifolds and cut collectors is my little angle level angle compass angle gauge whatever you want to call it I'm sure there's a thousand different names for it. What it is, it's a little magnetic bottomed gauge that sits on this clamp like so. You have your little thumb screw on the bottom and you can put a piece of pipe or tube in, tighten this down, and then as you rotate, it tells you the degree of rotation that you are positioned at. So without this, I don't know of another easy way, or at least I haven't been able to find one in the length of time that I have done this type of work, that will 
allow you to figure out degrees of rotation that quickly, that easily on a piece that you're cutting. So without that, I'd be kind of screwed to make merge collectors. And I don't think I would even bother. I'd probably just order pre-built ones and be stuck with predetermined geometry for collectors as opposed to being able to make my own. And it may not be a normal measuring tool, but it does assist with getting measurements and inspecting things. Cheap little park store flashlight. I have this Coast one over here that has had dead batteries for months at this point in time. This one's pretty nice as you can pull the actual lens on it and adjust the beam field. But I need to just get some new batteries for it and I can get back to using it again as I did buy it to sit on the bench here. And there is one more set of tools that I want to talk about while we're talking about measuring. And although they aren't necessarily for, for measuring, they are for drafting. And drafting and measuring kind of go hand in hand. So this is my transfer punch set. Again, nice little Harbor Freight piece. Harbor Freight, everybody loves to hate them. But when you need tools, you need them quick, you need them cheap, and you need a variety of them they're kind of the easy go-to. So what these are, they are center punches that have different diameters to them. So what you can do is take them and say you're trying to transfer, you're trying to transfer the pattern, or the bolt pattern of a flange over onto a piece of raw material that you are making. These allow you to do that. So you have from the smallest all the way to the largest and you can see the variety of different sizes that they provide with this little setup here. And I've made numerous flanges for the Supra and for other applications just using these transfer punches and taking the factory piece, tracing out on a piece of material, makes it extremely easy and almost no measuring involved. You put these in, if it doesn't fit the hole quite right, rock it around in a circle, you scribe a center hole on the piece of material that you are going to cut out of. You can center punch from there, drill your holes, and move on. So these, if it weren't for them, I would not be able to, or not be willing to, I guess would be the proper way to put it, make custom flanges, and it would be a nightmare to do that without this, uh, this little set here. PPE is concerned, everything that I use on a normal basis is right here. We will start with the welding hood. So I use a simple Jackson passive welding hood. It's a number 11 gold lens on it. And obviously it is sticker bombed to death, but these, I like them because they're simple, they're cheap, and they just work. You don't have to deal with uh, photoreceptive sensors that can be blocked if you're doing out of position welding on a cage or something like that. They end up flashing and you catch the brightness of the arc directly in the eyes, which we all, as far as I can tell, probably want to keep our eyesight. So these are an idiot technology proof way to eliminate the possibility of arc flashing yourself. So inside you can see just how large that viewing area is there. I mean, you have this entire section here that you can see through. So if you're in a weird position, you can look down out of the corner of your eyes, you can look up all around, and you have essentially nothing blocking any area that you can view like you would have with an auto darkener that has all of the adjustment buttons and knobs and what have you on the inside. So these things are also nice because if it breaks, I believe the hood is like 50 bucks as opposed to a few hundred that you would pay for an auto darkener. And I find them to be more effective. The glass lens on it is extremely crystal clear and they're very easy to maintenance. On the inside, you have just this metal wire, pull it together, pop it, 
out of the way there. You can pop the lens out, replace it, replace the protective screen on the outside, and it just work. And I can't say enough good things about them. Take a little bit of getting used to. Uh, you can't, obviously when you flip the hood down, you can't see what's going on until the arc is struck. So it takes some practice to use these and to be effective with them. But once you get the muscle memory developed of flip the hood down, strike the arc, and then kind of walk the torch in the place where it needs to be, I can't recommend them highly enough. And I probably will never go back to another auto darkening hood again. So moving past that, protecting our lungs. I have this 3M respirator that I will use it if I'm doing any heavy cutting, grinding, anything that's putting up abrasive dust up into the air. As in my younger years, I breathe enough of that crap in, and as I'm getting older now, start to realize that we are mortal beings, and I don't particularly want to die from some horrible lung cancer brought about by having a bunch of old sandpaper and cutting abrasive in my lungs. So doing anything heavy, like using the big sander or using the angle grinder when it's puffing a ton of abrasive debris up in the air, it takes five seconds to throw this thing on. And yeah, it isn't the most comfortable thing in the world, but it's that added little layer of protection where I'm not breathing that in and I feel a little bit better about it. So. Protecting our ears, I use the, just this basic, simple pair of headphones that can't remember where I got them, but they do work quite well. And you guys see me pretty much any time I'm using one of the grinders, using the angle grinder, anything that produces an uncomfortably loud noise, I just throw these on. Again, not the most comfortable thing in the world, but it takes two seconds to pop these on your head and it cuts out all the harshness or most of the harshness of the noises that are going on in a normal production fab shop like this. So I highly recommend wearing some sort of ear pro. That's why you see them in big factories and so on and so forth as a little bit of noise won't hurt you but I spent enough time again younger years you know everything when you were early 20s so on and so forth that I spent enough time without wearing ear pro and shooting guns and everything else that I already have a little bit of tinnitus and I do not want to exacerbate that process any more than I have to. As far as eye pro goes, I wear just these simple, basic, cheapy, plastic uh, little safety goggles here. And I like them because they, even though these ones are scratched up quite a bit, they're still nice and clear and you can see what you're doing and they keep the majority of debris out of your eyes. I'm not sure if any of you guys have had metal taken out of your eyes before, but it is not the most fun thing to do. I've gotten lucky enough where the times that I've had it, the uh, optical surgeon or eye doctor, whoever I was going to, was able to take a needle and pluck the piece out of my eye. And bear in mind, I say I was lucky enough to have somebody stab me in the eye with a needle. There are worse ways that you can have pieces of metal taken out, such as a drill. And if I can throw these things on in that period of time, angle my head correctly so any debris will hit the surface of the goggles as opposed to my eyes, and protect myself from having to go and have that lovely experience of people messing around with my eyes, I will do so. Beyond those, I wear these, I believe they are from the Black Stallion Company. These are called driver's gloves, or what they market as driver's gloves. And they're just a nice, thicker leather glove. It's kind of like a medium thickness, so think of it as a hybrid between or a middle ground between a thin TIG glove that provides a ton of dexterity and a thick mid glove that provides <clears throat> a large amount of protection against significant heat from the MIG arc and higher amperage. So they're just thick enough where I can use them as a fabrication glove. So grinding and cutting and dealing with things that are hot, 
but they're thin enough where I still have dexterity to, fill, to feed filler rod, to work with my hands, and to not feel like I'm an astronaut trying to use a quarter inch wrench. So beyond that, it isn't exactly PPE, but I do, and as you guys have seen, I like to wear just a basic pair of these nitrile or latex gloves as I'm working with especially pieces of metal that I have applied a nice surface finish to or things like titanium where any little bit of oils from your skin can very easily become impregnated into the metal and then you end up with like a beautiful anodized intercooler tube with a thumbprint in the middle of it. So these again similar to the driver's gloves I get about a medium thickness. I can't remember the actual mill thickness of these, but they're not paper thin and they aren't like chemical gloves where you can't feel what you're doing and you don't want to wear them. These I can wear them around all day and not almost forget that I have them on my hands. So they keep your hands off of the material and they also keep much of the dirtiness that is inherent in a fab shop off of your hands. So you can go an entire day if you're gloved up and not really have to wash your hands at the end of the day, which, or sit there and scrub to get a bunch of dirt and grime off of your hands, which is pretty nice. So PPE wise, fairly simple. I, as you, I'm sure you guys can tell, there's a continuing theme throughout all of the tooling that I use here where simplicity is key. I don't want to have to overthink anything that I'm doing. I want the quickest and easiest thing that will work the most effectively, which I think is probably the key to efficiency and makes it so nothing that you're doing is any more cumbersome than it really needs to be. The other important thing to note in regards to PPE is it may suck, it may be uncomfortable, you may not like it, but suck it up and just do it. You get one chance at your life and at having all of your appendages and having your eyes and everything that is part of your body and part of your life. So the last thing that you want to have happen is to become severely injured or maimed or even possibly killed by something that can be easily avoided by some simple PPE and some common sense and logic in using these, I mean, tools that have the very real possibility of being dangerous. I, mean, I have numerous scars. I have a big one on my hand here from a cutoff wheel popping. And I have scars all over from being burned and smashing hands and what have you. So it's an inherent risk that you take with this type of work, but why make it any riskier than it has to be? So sorry for a little bit of a dad talk there, but I am pretty adamant on just taking the couple of seconds, taking the initiative to use that PPE, to use it correctly and to protect yourself from things that can be easily avoided that can cause pretty serious harm to you as the welder fabricator. More important than any of the tools that I just showed all of you guys is the knowledge on how to use them. So there is no substitute for experience with any of this type of work. It just takes time. There's no magic formula. There is, There are no shortcuts. You just have to put the work in and figure out what works best for you. Now everything that I've shown here is what I choose to use and it may not work for everybody. You can use more tools, you can use less tools, you can use different brands, different types, what have you. The most important thing is knowing how to use them properly and how to use them to be able to produce the end product that you want to. So personally, I would like to have a few other odds and ends here, such as a mill, a lathe, what have you, but I don't have the ability to have those things right now. So I make do with what I have and try to use the tools that I have here to their utmost capabilities and in some cases using tools in ways that they weren't designed to be used to produce the end results that I'm looking for. Now that covers the majority of the basics as far as 
I guess what you call welding and fabrication specialty tools, even though the there's a lot of the tools that I use here that serve purposes that are farther reaching than just welding and fab. But I obviously have, you guys have seen me use the three in one sheet tool, the positioner, I have a MIG, and obviously a toolbox that's full of all different hand tools and everything. If I could do it again, I probably would not have spent the money on that badge, but I have it, it holds all the tools, and I don't feel like transferring everything over to another box. That'll probably about wrap it up, and I hope this wasn't too boring of a video. I know there's not a whole lot of action as opposed to normally working on the car, but we're in kind of a lull period while I'm waiting on a few bits to come in so we can keep making progress with it. But I digress. As usual, be sure to subscribe, leave a like, leave a comment, and until next time, I'll see you later.